Hey guys, how you doing? Let's pray that by the grace and mercy of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, the modem is running, it's warmed up, and that by the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, there'll be no buffering. So pray. Can you pray for that? Because usually we buffer a few times, but I pray the buffering's gone. At least it's 99% better than it was. So good to see you. It's been, what, over a week? Almost two weeks? Good to see all of you guys. Theistic, Revolution, Sargon, Melanie, Cambello. What's going on, Melanie? What's up with that with that heart ice? I haven't shaved. See, there it goes. Yeah. Yeah. See, I told you, pray in Jesus' name. It warms up in Jesus' name. Lord, bless the connection so the buffering goes away. What's up, Melanie? I haven't shaved. I look older. What's up with that? I'm not as good looking as I was in the other occasions. What's up, Mike? Nice to see you guys. Hopefully it doesn't buffer. I, this is the best we have. It's 99% better than it was. Right. Sorry, that coughed in my nose. We'll just wait a few minutes, as usual, as our habit is. We wait a few more minutes. I don't know who NSPYR. Are you saying me? You'll debate me on Tawheed? Someone wants to get hurt today. I think it's him. Yeah, actually, we're planning to do another response, Lord Jesus willing. If our Lord Jesus wills, Lord Jesus Christ willing. Tomorrow, we're going to do another response at none. He just came out with an absolutely pathetic response. An absolutely pathetic response. The guy is getting more dishonest, more deceitful more wicked in imitation of his prophet and his deity. Did you see his latest response? Did you guys see his latest response? Hey, a brother, the light of truth, the light, the truth. Do me a favor. I know you mean well, and you love me for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to use this as a platform to talk about people unless I have to necessarily, the light, the truth. Don't ever mention Rob Christian in the same sentence with me. Don't do that, brother, please. I don't want to start chaos or division or <clears throat> put a weapon in the hands of Muslims. Do not mention him or Takiya Watch. I'd appreciate it, brother. Don't do that. So, Because I don't want to say anything publicly. So I know you think you're complimenting me when you put me in the same sentence with him. You're not. And don't put him in the same sentence with Christian Prince or David Wood. Don't insult my brothers that way, please, okay? Don't do that. The light, the truth. You may think he's great, but that's your prerogative. You're free to your opinion. Hold on. So don't do that, brother, because now you just wasted my time in talking about it. Sorry about that. Man, I got huge nostrils. So, folks, how long has it been? We're going to wait a few minutes, and by the grace of Jesus Christ, if the Lord Jesus is pleased in his infinite love and mercy and compassion and his power to reinvigorate me, to rejuvenate me, to replenish me, and to purify me in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and fill me with this Holy Spirit, grant me the health I need to glorify the name of Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit and the holiness that I desperately need to delight his heart, not disappoint him. I'll be back live streaming regularly but when was the last time when was the last time that i had a live stream what was it i did live streams with david wood but what was it was it on easter right easter nspyr do you want to waste my time with your nonsense or do you want to listen because i will block you or challenge you to call me on skype it's like asking me which of the various Muslim denominations, right, is true Islam. Didn't even your false prophet say that Islam would be divided into 73 groups? There we go, guys. Uh, the guy hid NSPYR before even allowing him to respond. We're starting it again, man. Oh, boy, here we go. It's been a while. I haven't been on, and already we're starting it. I'm asking the guy a question, and Jonathan Simon hides him. 
I'm not cut out for this. I really am not. I really am not cut out for this. Uh, we just It's been over, what, almost two weeks? If you guys were wondering why. And by the way, uh, Navy boy, are you here, friend? Navy boy? Daily Light. Can you ask me that three more times, brother? Do you see what the title is? You gave me a hard time last time when I was talking to the seven-day Adventist when you chimed in and basically told me to take it easy. And you didn't even know what I was doing. And you thought I forgot about that. Daily Light, do you see the title? It says, Worship God Alone, an Objection Against the Trinity. So let me change the focus of my discussion. Let me ignore it because it's your world. We're all squirrels in your world. It's all about you and about your interests. And I'm going to open up Skype for you. Will that help you? Would that make you happy, Daily Light? Let me know. Would that make you happy? No, just tell me. I want to know. I want to make you happy, brother. I'm, I exist to make you happy. Remember, see, sarcasm. Here, watch this shirt. Sarcasm is just one of my many talents. I even bought that shirt deliberately. Okay. I exist to make you happy, Daily Light. My existence is centered on your happiness. It's your world. We're all squirrels. Sargon is a squirrel. I'm a squirrel. That's it. So go ahead, Daily Light. Tell me how to communicate to people. Tell me how to debate. Tell me what to talk about and what not to talk about. Because I exist for you. That's it. Right? Yeah, guys, if you can hit the like button, I'd appreciate it. And keep praying. Now you can send NSPYR to Mecca to smooch the black stone. If you can. Now you can do it. Now, just to let you know, because I got, I need to begin in prayer. I want to, first of all, right off the bat, I just want to thank every one of you for standing with me and my daughters through your prayers and your fasting, praying for my daughters and I, crying out to the Lord Jesus Christ to bless us. And I want to thank all of you who are supporting me to do the ministry. You know who you are. Those of you who support me via Patreon or Super Chat or even PayPal, you know who you are. Please forgive me if I don't respond to you personally. I do have a lot on my plate, and I want to use that as an excuse, but I do. I just want to say thank you from my heart. You don't have to be here to listen to me. You don't have to put up with me and my imperfections. You don't have to pray for me or support me, but you do for your love for Jesus Christ, because I trust the Holy Spirit is putting in your heart that in spite of my imperfections and flaws, the Holy Spirit is using me to glorify Jesus, and you're trusting the Spirit to use my mouth to bless you for the glory of Jesus Christ. So I just want to thank you guys. You know who you are. Your reward is with the Lord Jesus Christ, and may the Lord Jesus, whom I love, and though I love him imperfectly to my shame and I fail him, may the Lord Jesus, who loves us perfectly with an infinite love, bless you and your loved ones tremendously. Seal us by his spirit, cover us by his blood, the blood of the lamb, the Lord Jesus, and never allow us to turn away from him, deny him or betray him, but die in union with him, in love with him, loving him more and more in Jesus' name. So I just want to thank you guys. You know you are. If you're wondering why I haven't live streamed, when was it? Easter, I did a live stream, and I came on to try to debate someone. Let me share again something from my heart. I know I shouldn't be this open, especially on a public forum and social media, because we have enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, people who hate me, even Christians, Christians who don't like me. And to be honest, they're Christians I don't like. I really don't like them, right? And some, I even question their Christianity. I really do. I question whether they're believers or they're snakes, wolves, and sheep's clothing. Honestly, because what did Paul say? They'll be false brethren, phantom. False brethren, wolves in sheep's clothing, and even people from our midst who will try to destroy the flock. It's in Acts 20, verses 27 to 29. So I know there are Christians here who hate me. That doesn't mean they're not Christians. It means that like me, let me just share it again. Like me, they are sinners like I am that struggle with sinful passions and imperfections. And like me, need the Holy Spirit to transform them, transform us to become more like Jesus Christ. So I'm aware of that, right? I'm aware a lot of people don't like me. There's a lot of people I don't like. I just don't like them. I want to be real with you. I want to be your brother. 
I want to be as transparent as possible so you don't make me more than I am and think I am higher or better than you. I am not, and I mean that from my heart. I want to be your brother, and I want you to see me as a sinner who has been beaten, who has sinful passions that he wrestles with, who needs Jesus desperately just as much as every one of you, right? So I just want to, I want you to see, uh, honestly, I want you to see me as your brother. I'm not, but honestly, the Lord knows I mean this, even though I have anger issues and pride issues. I am not better than you guys. I am not. I may be gifted in an area that's not your gifting, but you are gifted as well. You are. If you believe the Bible, if you believe the Bible, and we do believe the Bible because it's the word of the living God. The Bible says every born again believer has a gift. In fact, maybe multiple gifts. Your gifting may not be teaching, but you have a gift. And you are just as important to the body of Christ as David Wood and I. You are not less important. You're just as important. In fact, I would say those who are gifted to pray, let me encourage you. Holy Spirit, take over. Holy Spirit, bless this session. Holy Spirit, crucify our flesh. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ and fill me to glorify Jesus and save me from error. We love you, Holy Spirit. We worship you. Take over this session, please, in Jesus' name. Please. Here. Let me tell you who's even more important than someone like me. The prayer warriors. Those of you who have been given the gift, because you know who you are, God gives certain individuals the ability to pray for hours as if it's minutes. Minutes, Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Hours of praying, and it's like it's minutes for them because it comes natural for them because the Holy Spirit has set them apart. You will be my prayer warriors, my intercessors. You who pray for us, you who fast for us, in my estimation, you are more important than someone like me because it's your prayers and your fasting that covers me and my daughters from the evil one. And I thank you and I love every one of you. And every one of you has a gift. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here, let me give you the chapter. We're not going to read it. Read the entire chapter 12. Just chapter 12. I was going to say, no, just read the entire chapter. It says we're all members of the spiritual body of Jesus. Jesus is the head who nourishes his body who supplies the members of his body with everything they need to attain spiritual maturity and to conform to the image of Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit, right? You are just as important as I am, if not more so. I am not better than you. And I want to say this from my heart. I mean it. I really mean this. I am not better than you guys. And if I give the impression I am, forgive me. Forgive me if I do. You are my family, and I pray Jesus helps me to love you more and realize that he put you in my life because I need you like you need me, and we need Jesus. And Jesus is the only one who needs nothing from creation. So I want to remind you of your importance and your value. If you believe the Bible, God has gifted you. He's given you a gift or multiple gifts. Ask the Holy Spirit, seek the face of the Spirit to show you what your gift is. Okay, ask him. Your gift may be praying, fasting. Your gift may be evangelizing and giving financially. Even giving money, even giving, that's a gift. Because some people have a hard time parting with their money, but they do so as a sacrifice. Others, God has given them such generous hearts, they give out money like it's going out of style, even if it hurts them. And they don't care because that's your gifting. Do you know that? That's your gifting. Do you know? Let me now show you something before I begin. Do you know? Do you know that even being a construction worker, being able to construct buildings is a gift of the Holy Spirit? It is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So some of you are construction workers and you're excellent at it. And that's the Holy Spirit gifting you to be excellent at it so you can use that gift for the glory of Jesus in whatever manner the Holy Spirit has decided. Did you know that? Can I show you that? That even the ability to do craftsmanship, construction, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, can I prove that to you? Let's go to Exodus 31, verses 1 to 6. I'm not lying. Exodus 31, verses 1 to 6. Let me show you. 
and thank the mods, thank our brothers and sisters who are helping me to help you. Here, let me show you. All right. Here, let me take Protestant. His gifting is serving. He serves sacrificially and unselfishly. He'll spend hours in posting verses and beatifying my YouTube channel and putting thumbnails without complaining. Protestant believer, without complaining, without demanding attention, and without demanding pay from me. That is a gift. Okay. Now let's read Exodus 31 verses 1, 1 to 6. Let me scroll back and read. And Jehovah the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Basileel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him. Guys, pay attention now. Verse 3, I'm not lying. Here it goes. God is saying, I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, craftsmanship. Okay. And all manner of workmanship, craftsmanship. Why? To devise cunning works. Cunning doesn't mean deceitful works. It means very articulate works. To work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, and I behold, have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan, Dan and in the hearts of all that... Are wise. Did you catch it? So you thought I was lying to you, right? Exodus 31, verses 1 to 6, specifically verse 3 says, God filled Bazalil with the Spirit to give him wisdom from the Spirit, knowledge from the Spirit, understanding from the Spirit, and the ability to construct the temple of God in a beautiful, intri intricate manner. Go ahead. Thank you, Victoria. I'm a small fan of yours. <laughs> okay. So I want you to realize every one of you have a gift or gifts that the Spirit has given you. Ask the Spirit to confirm what those gifts are and ask the Spirit to give you the opportunity to use them. You may not be called to be a Bible teacher. But one thing I can say, we're all called to evangelize and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I need your prayers and I need your gifts to help me in those areas I don't have gifts. Now, let me again show you the wisdom of God, because I want to talk about this a little bit before we get into the meat of the matter. And I pray we get more people. Lord, bring more people for your glory in Jesus' name. Okay? Because I haven't done a live stream in two weeks. We're up to about 270. Praise his only name. But that's okay. God is good. I'll build it up again. Let me tell you why the, God in his wisdom hasn't given any one human being all the gifts. But he's designed it in that he'll give me these gifts but won't give me other gifts, but he'll give you those gifts to teach us to be interdependent, that we are members of a body, and as members of the body, we do not exist independently. We must exist interdependently in union with one another because Jesus didn't just come to save individuals. He came to save individuals to form communities. He came to build a church. And the church of Jesus consists of individuals purchased by his blood, born of his spirit, sealed by his spirit, made inseparable in the bond of the spirit, and completely dependent on our head, Jesus Christ, for everything. So, whether you like it or not, I need you, you need me, because God designed it that way. He designed it that way. You get it? God designed it that way. And if you want to prove, read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just read chapter 12. Read the entire chapter, all of it. It's 31 verses. Eric Brown, you'll know it because the mouth of two or three witnesses, meaning more than one person independently will tell you something. For example, Eric, a person may come, to, come up to you and say, hey, you know, has anyone told you? Man, you're, you're like really gifted as a speaker. Ever think about teaching? Let's say. And then someone else comes later on and says, wow, man, you're such a wonderful speaker, man. You should be teaching. See, that's how it works. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, God will confirm a manner and typically uses believers, but he can also use unbelievers. He can even open the mouth of an unbeliever to confirm what your gift is. Right? 
And you must use the gift to glorify Christ and build the church. So I just want to share that with you. Now, just to let you know why I haven't been able to live stream, Satan came and really tried to knock me down emotionally. Uh, D. Gamas, you're an idiot, you're a fool, you're a moron because you don't know how to interpret scripture. So don't ever misquote 522 of Matthew because you're an idiot, you're a moron like the God that you serve because you don't worship the true God. Get this guy out of here. Fool, misquoting Matthew 522. Here you go. All right, now. Now let me come back. It started Easter Sunday. Satan knows how to attack you. The battle is real. The spirit realm is real. Because if the Bible is true, God is real. And the God of the Bible tells us there's a spirit realm where you have the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the sun, at war with the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. Satan and his minions do not sleep. Let me remind you. Satan and his minions do not sleep. They're working 24 hours, seven days a week to destroy the people of God and keep people away from the knowledge of the true God, from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Satan likes to target those who are in the limelight. Satan likes to bring down those who are in the public view, meaning the David Woods, the James Whites, the Christian Princes, the Sama Dak Doks, the William Lane Craig. Why? Because Satan realizes these are the ones that are influencing the masses to know who Jesus is, to trust in Jesus and fall in love with Jesus and escape his snares. So they are the instruments of God to destroy the kingdom of darkness and keep people away from Satan. They're in the public limelight. Right? So what does Satan do? He comes after them viciously in order to destroy their testimony, to cause people to turn away from Christ or to cause them to stop ministry. And he will not stop until you die or Jesus returns or until you fail. Let me repeat. He will not stop until you die and you graduate to heaven or Jesus returns or until you fail. He will not stop. So if he can't get you one way, he'll get you another way. So what did he do? A big week, resurrection, Easter weekend. Glorifying Jesus Christ's resurrection. David was telling me, hey, we're going to be doing some live streams, destroying Islam and exposing Muhammad as an agent of Satan in the Quran, a satanic book. I go, count me in. Guess what happened? You guys, can I let you in? Guess what happened? How did Satan attack me? See, Satan knows where to hit you. Satan knows what will distract you. And what would be my weakness? My daughters. Up until that point, my daughters rarely called me. Now you tell me if this is a coincidence. Starting Easter Sunday, my daughters wouldn't stop calling me every day and stand, staying on the phone for hours because they were begging me to come back. We miss you. We love you. You need to be here. And even my oldest daughter started crying. Why aren't you here? And I had to spend Hours and days comforting them, reassuring them, and telling them I haven't gone. And promising them if you trust Jesus and cry out to Jesus, he will bring you to me. But guess what the devil did to try to discourage me? One of my greatest fears is having another man in the house with them. And guess what I found out? My ex-wife's boyfriend, Michelle's boyfriend, Martin, is virtually living in my home, fornicating, Actually, adultery with my daughters knowing that the man is there sleeping over. You see the knife? You see what Satan did? In this COVID-19 pandemic, their mother, who professes to be a Christian, committing sexual morality fornication by bringing this man whom she's not married to, to pretty much live in the home that the Lord gave me for my daughters, with my daughters knowing he's there. Because how do I know? Because when I was talking to them, my youngest said, shh, quiet, Martin's sleeping. I said, what do you mean Martin's sleeping? He goes, yeah, he's sleeping in mommy's bed. What kind of example are you setting for my daughters? Not only did you commit adultery and destroy the marriage, 
twice, not once. You're not even married to this man. You claim to be a Christian, and you know their father is a man of Christ trying to teach them godliness and holiness, and that this is not the way for women to behave, and this is what you do. See? So that's what I've been going through. This is my battle. And there's nothing I can do about it. Nothing I can do about it. You see? The battle is the Lord Jesus. So Satan knew how to hit me. He hit me bad because my daughters are crying. But it's even worse, folks. She's even brainwashed them to trust that he's a good man. Because my oldest daughter keeps telling me, no, Baba Martin's okay. Uh, don't talk about him. And when I told my oldest daughter, this is sin, she ran to her mother and Martin saying, that's what I said. And then I got scathing text messages being attacked. By an unrepentant woman who doesn't fear Jesus, who doesn't take responsibility and say, I commit adultery, I destroyed the marriage, I am sorry, may the Lord forgive me, and would you forgive me? But justifies it. You see? This is my situation. And a corrupt legal system, folks. Try to destroy me financially and expects me, wants me to pay her, to finance her, to bring in men into a house that was given to me by the Lord for my daughters to commit fornication, adultery, and sexual morality. That's how this corrupt system rewards the adulterers and adulterers and the sexually immoral. So pray for me, folks. And I kept praying, God strengthen me. Holy Spirit fill me. Lord Jesus, crucify my flesh. Help me to love you more than my daughters because you are my life, not them. Heal and guard my heart. And guess what, folks? Guess what? You want to hear what's interesting? They stopped calling me yesterday. I haven't heard from them all day because I think their mother got upset what I was saying, and she was going, getting livid, and I think now she's trying to pull them away because she realizes I'm not going to hide her sin and shame anymore. My daughters mean more to me than her. And I don't want them to be influenced by a godless woman who's teaching them fornication is okay. It's not okay. It's a sin against Jesus. Anyway. So let's glorify the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Forgive us. Crucify our flesh. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb and fill us with the Spirit and use this session. Save me from error and stammering and bless me to bless your people. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. The battle is yours. Fight for my daughters. Save them from this immoral woman and this man, Martin, for your glory. They are yours, Father. They are yours, Lord Jesus. They are yours, Holy Spirit. It's your fight. Give me the grace to focus on you and not on my circumstances. And finish the race by the power of your spirit for the glory of Jesus in Jesus' name. So that's where I'm at. Okay, are we ready now? Now, wh why am I telling you? Here's why I'm telling you. Let me remind you I'm telling you. The battle is real. Satan wants us to be taken out. You understand why your prayers and fasting for us is important? You understand now? I want you to believe truly the spirit realm is absolutely real, more real than you can imagine. Satan wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy us, and he'll do anything and everything. You understand why we need your prayers and your fasting? Thank you. All dogs go to heaven. You with me there? So please don't underestimate how important and powerful your prayers to Jesus are. Your fasting for us because we need to be covered. All right? Christ is risen, risen indeed. Lord willing, tomorrow I'm going to do, is it part three, part four? Yeah, part four on being born again. I have to finish that. Don't think I've forgotten because that's important. Why must we be born again? And I'll explain that. So God willing, tomorrow, Lord willing, I'll do part four. But today I wanted to answer the objections raised by a Muslim during David Wood's live stream that I did with him. He brought up Matthew 4.10 and Revelation 19.10 was actually Revelation 22.9 to show only God is to be worshipped. Therefore, Jesus can't be God. So are you with me there? Are you ready? Glory to God. We're up to 200. Lord, bring more and hit that like button. Make this channel go viral for the glory of Jesus. Not for the praise of men, but for the glory of Jesus. Are you ready? Okay. So I wanted to address this.
I wanted to address this. Yeah, and pray for Mike A.D. He just said that he too is under demonic attack because of unbelieving family members. Pray for each other. All right. Matthew 4, verse 10. Let's read Matthew 4, verses 8 to 10. Louisa, good to see you, sister. Good to see all of you. Sorry about that. Hallelujah. Okay, let's read. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, God willing, I'm going to do a session on how could Satan tempt Jesus to worship him if he knew Jesus is God. That's an objection that comes up. I'll address that, God willing. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. See? Jesus tells Satan, Worship God alone. Therefore, Jesus is in God. You understand the objection? Do you understand the objection? Now, do me a favor. Remind me before I end the session to give you the links, because I did several articles on the issue how can Satan tempt Jesus Christ, our Lord, if Jesus is God in the flesh and Satan knew that? So I want to give you the article so you can read, and then, Lord willing, I'll do sessions on that. Are you guys interested? Interested in me doing some sessions explaining how could Satan tempt Jesus to worship him if Satan knew this is God in the flesh? No, it's, it's more complicated than Mel uh, Melanie. It's more complicated. It's the fact that Satan is telling Jesus, worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth. Hold on. Didn't Satan know that's God in the flesh? Yes. Does he know that God in the flesh is the one who created all the kingdoms and they belong to him already? And how could Satan even think that God in the flesh could worship him? So I will do that if you're interested. All right, you're back here again, man. After you took the shot at my daughter's on David Wood's stream. Now you're saying, hey, Brother Sam, you were on David's stream talking about you wanted to meet my daughters and get to know them. Yeah, a pedophile. David would block them for it. And now you're coming to my stream and pretending to be nice. Yeah. Hey, uh, I want to I, I get that. You didn't mean any harm by wanting to meet my daughters, a grown man with a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. You didn't mean any harm by it? You're ready to become a Muslim because Islam is a religion of pedophilia. So if you're a pedophile, let us know because we want to get you arrested because you're a sicko that needs to be locked away to keep children safe from you. Okay? And you're ready for Islam. Islam is a religion of pedophilia, not Christianity. Okay? Now, with that said, Lord willing, remind me. Remind me before... We end the stream to give you the articles. I wrote articles on Satan tempting Jesus. And how could that be possible if Satan knew Jesus is God in the flesh? Do remind me. All right? Do remind me. Okay? If you want to read it before I start doing the session, because God willing, in the upcoming week, we'll do sessions on it. Lord Jesus willing, I will do sessions on it. I promise you, if God gives me health and holiness and purity, I will do sessions on that. Protestant, can you post my PayPal for Sargon David? God bless you, brother. Okay, I know, because I'll give it to you later. So let's talk about this objection. What was the objection? See, Jesus said, yeah, I do. It's right there, Dre. It's right there. Thank you guys for your support. Jesus said, worship the Lord your God alone. This is also found in Luke 4, verses 5 to 8. So let's look at the parallel. Luke 4, verses 5 to 8. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. And I'm going to use now the synoptic gospels to show that Jesus is worshipped as God. And the devil, taking him up in, into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. Now I'm going to come back and explain this a little more in depth. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. 
And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. See, Jesus says, Worship God, not him. Therefore, he's not God. Now, side issue, because you want to learn the meat of Scripture. I want to give you Wagyu steak, like Phantom says. Deep meat by the power of the Holy Spirit illuminating us for the glory of Jesus. Let's look at Luke 4, verse 6 one more time. Look what Satan said. Luke 4, verse 6. Watch what he says to our Lord, our blessed Lord and Savior. Here I'm going to now challenge you to think more deeply and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate you to understand the depth of Scripture. And I'll do a session on this as well. As long as God gives me the health and holiness provision, I'll do it. And the devil said unto him, all this power, all these kingdoms of the earth. Look what Satan's saying. All the kingdoms of the earth has been given to me, and their glory are mine. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it to. So it's been given to me, delivered to me, the kingdoms of the earth and their glory, and I can give it to whom I want. Now, was Satan lying, or was he speaking the truth? You want meat, right? You don't want me to just go surface, right? You want meat? You want meat? All right. Power meaning authority. Exousia meaning authority. Okay. Jesus says Satan wasn't lying. You know how I know? Let's go to John 12, verse 31. John 12, verse 31. Thank you, Conflict Ortiz. No, he was speaking the truth, Jojo, my beloved sister. John 12, 31. Jesus says he's speaking the truth. Good to see you, Rachel Magdalene. Good to see all you wonderful, beautiful sisters who love Jesus. A lot of these sisters are single, guys. They love Jesus. They're beautiful and they're single. Okay. John 12, 31, what does our Lord say? Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Aha. Jesus says the prince of this world, the ruler of this world shall be cast out. Did you catch it? The ruler of this world will be condemned, cast out. So Jesus has just called. Satan, the ruler of this world, the prince of this world. John 14, verse 30. John 14, verse 30. Okay. Satan was not lying, Pedro, no. John 14, verse 30. Read with me. No, Pistol Pete, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 is a little more complicated. Don't bring in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. You're, now I got to do another session. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, stick with these. John 14, verse 30. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Okay, let's post that one more time. John 14, verse 30. Magdalene, you got to change your picture. Picture. You're so stunningly beautiful by the grace of God. He's made you like a model for Jesus. It's hard to look at you. Oh, be, be still my heart. I'm about to have a heart attack. Whew. All right, all right. John 14, 30. Let's focus. See, oh, look what you did. Oh, my heart. My heart, my heart. Just kidding. Okay. Anyway, John 14, 30. Let's read it again. One more time. Denise, Denise. All right, read this. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and had nothing in me. Notice what our Lord said. My time speaking with you is short. Listen. My time speaking with you is short because the prince of the world is coming. Coming to do what? What does our Lord mean that the prince of the world is coming? And he has nothing in me. Let's unpack this. What does he mean there? I won't talk to you for for long because the prince of the world is coming what is he saying there folks yes black smurf the prince of the world is coming to condemn me to die on the cross he's coming to get rid of me to instigate my murder my death so the time i have to speak with you is short but then notice what he says he has say he says he has nothing in me did you catch it? He has nothing in me. 
You guys see it, right? He has nothing in me. You know what he means by that? He means he has no authority over me. Why? Because he's sinless. Jojo got it. Here our Lord is telling us, if you're sinless, Satan has no hold over you. If you're sinless, Satan has no power over you. If you're sinless, Satan has no authority over you. It's when you sin and are a sinner, you come under the authority and influence of Satan. And because Jesus is sinless, Jesus is sinless, Satan has no authority over him. Did you catch it? You understand what our Lord just said? He has nothing in me. He has no influence over me. He has no control over me. Why? Because he's the absolute sinless, pure, holy lamb, son of God. But what does that imply? It implies if you're a sinner, you're under his influence, under his control, under his dominion. You understand what this is implying now? Is it making sense? If you're a sinner, he has dominion over you. He has power over you. He has control over you. Because the punishment of sin, the consequence and judgment of sin is that God hands you over to Satan and sin to ensnare and enslave you, which is why Jesus has, has to set you free. But in order for him to set you free, he has to pay your debt in order to ransom you. There's a debt to be paid for you to be ransomed from your bondage to Satan and sin. And Jesus paid the debt to redeem and ransom you. You get it? Is it making sense now? John 16, verse 11. John 16, verse 11. Watch here. Of judgment, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of judgment. The Holy Spirit will condemn the world. Why? Judge the world, convict the world, condemn the world for its evil. Why? Why will the Holy Spirit convict the world of judgment? Because the prince of this world is judged. So is it clear in these three references, the prince of this world is Satan who's in opposition to Christ, who has no authority over Christ, no influence over Christ, and who now stands condemned, judged, and cast out by the work of Jesus. Is it making sense? So did Satan lie when he said, all this authority of all these kingdoms and their glory have been given to me, delivered to me, and I can give it to him whom I want. No, he wasn't lying. He was telling the truth. You understand what it means? That means if you want to get rich in this life, if you want to get famous in this life, if you want to be powerful in this life, sell your soul to the devil and he'll make you rich, famous, and powerful in this life. That's why you hear people selling their souls to the devil. It's not a lie. When you hear about people selling their souls to the devil, it is not fake. It's actually true. Because the Bible says, if you swear allegiance to the devil and worship him, he'll make you so powerful and so rich and so famous. But here's the problem. The riches he gives you, the power he gives you, the fame he lavishes on you is temporary and will not last because either you'll die or Jesus will come and condemn him to hell. You with me there? So that's why you hear about people selling their souls to the devil. And now you have a biblical basis for it. Now, if someone says, where is that in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? That if I swear allegiance to Satan or obey Satan or worship Satan, 
He can make me rich, famous, and powerful. I just gave it to you. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. Specifically, Matthew 4, 8 to 9. And Luke 4, verses 5 to 8. Specifically, Luke 4, verse 6. It's there. It's a biblical teaching. Yes, Alvin, they can. You can be a believer who's financially rich because God is blessing you with financial riches to use it sacrificially to help the people of God, to help true churches that love Jesus, to help ministries, to help the poor, to help the widow, to help orphans. Yes, you can be rich and a slave of Jesus, provided you use your riches to glorify Christ and love Jesus more than your money. Let me show you that. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 to 19. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 to 19. Now you got your answer, right, Hayden? First Timothy 6, 17, 19. I was asked the question, can you be rich and a Christian? Yes, you can be rich and a Christian. Here you go, Jamal. Everyone read. 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Paul talking to the affluent Christians, believers who love Jesus, who are rich. Notice what he says to them, 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, arrogant, and proud, right? Nor trust in uncertain riches, because you may be rich today, but then you'll be poor tomorrow. Let's say you're invested in the, in the stock market. You know that the stock market can crash, and there goes all your wealth, and now you are poor and end up becoming a beggar like the rest of us. Riches are not certain, meaning the riches of this world. So don't put your hope in them, but what do you do with your riches? There you go. Paul is saying it. But in living in the living God, put your hope in the living God, not your money, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So God wants you to enjoy his creation, provided you enjoy it lawfully. And I'll explain what I mean by that. You see what 1 Timothy 6, 17 says? God, who's the living God, supplies you with all you need to enjoy his creation. And I'll explain what he means in a minute. So those who are rich in this world, that they do good, that they be rich in good works. Let your good works make you rich in heaven. Right? Ready to distribute, willing to communicate, to transfer over laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Does he catch it? First Timothy 6 17 19 did not say to those who are rich, give up your riches and be poor. He didn't say that, did he? Yes, Jamal. If you want to contradict the Bible, Jamal, and pit Jesus' words to the rich man against Paul. Then you got a contradiction. Jamal, you're, you, you know better than to do that. Jesus' point to the rich man was his riches were his idol. His money became his God, his idol. So in his case, he had to die to his idol and get rid of it. But here Paul, talking to people who are rich, he doesn't say give up your riches. He says don't trust in them. Don't make them your idol. Don't make them your God that you depend on them. Trust in the living God and then give generously to those in need for the glory of Jesus. Has everyone got it now? But did you see what 1 Timothy 6.17 says? 1 Timothy 6.17 says, let's look at it one more time. Because I'm going to tie it in again with the topic of Satan. And then the worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at it one more time. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, arrogant, and proud, and looking down on the poor. Like, you're, look, I'm special because I drive a BMW. I'm special because I live in a million-dollar home. I'm special because I got a Gucci, you know, whatever. I don't know much about these things anyway. But you get the point, right? Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Let me explain what he means. Folks, sexual 
Intimacy is a gift God gave you to enjoy, provided you do it lawfully. Let me explain what I mean. Who do you think gave you sexual passions and desires? God. Why? Because that will be one of the reasons that will move you to marry and unite with the opposite sex and become one flesh and be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. So sex in of itself is not evil. It's the abuse and misuse of sex that's evil. That's what makes sex evil when you use it unlawfully, abuse it, and you live for sex and sexual gratification. But God wants you to enjoy sex with your partner, your spouse in marriage of the opposite gender. So don't think as Christians, God is this cruel God who doesn't want you to enjoy sexual intimacy, but deprive yourself. No, he wants you to enjoy it in its fullest with the woman or the man that God has appointed for you. Enjoy each other. It's the misuse of it. It's the abuse of it that God condemns, especially when it becomes an idol where the eye of man is not satisfied and no matter what, he's got to find more women to gratify his lust as opposed to being content with that one woman that God has given him to enjoy her as much as he wants. And by the way, side note, I think someone needs to hear it. If I'm talking about it, I'm trusting because the Spirit is guiding me this direction. My prayer is the Holy Spirit will take over the sessions and guide me to speak on those issues he wants me to speak for the glory of Christ and the edification of the church. By the way, one of the weapons of Satan that spouses inadvertently use, meaning they use it not knowing that they're being used of the devil. Because if you're a believer, if you're a believer, you're born of the Spirit, Satan can't possess you and make you do something. He can try to influence you, right, and cause you to stumble. But because of the Holy Spirit, you can resist him and overcome him. But let me tell you what people do to punish the opposite partner, meaning their, their, their spouse. Let me make it clear if I wasn't clear. The only intimacy that God accepts and blesses, husband and wife, one born male in gender, one born female in gender, not someone who changes their gender, coming together in holy matrimony, husband and wife become one flesh. That's the only intimacy God honors. Now, with that said, a weapon of Satan, you know what it is? To use sexual intimacy as a weapon to punish your partner in order to drive your partner away or cause your partner to burn with lust and stumble. And that is a ploy of the devil. Sorry about this. This is a, this is a visitor. He's here delivering food. Thank you, sir. Your tip is on the counter. Very right, sir. Someone said, hey, Sal, you're pal. Everyone knows you, and I made you famous. That's the delivery guy. All right. Okay, coming back to the issue. See, they can hear the air conditioning. But, uh, Leon, I'm going to turn it on. Go ahead. All right. We'll get on. We'll turn it on. Sorry, guys. You may hear the, uh, uh, the air conditioning, because right now we're at, it's 100 degrees, but it's the kind of 100 that's beautiful, right? Yeah. I was outside. It's a gorgeous 100. All right, let me get my uh my thing. Hold on, hold on, guys. Let me do that. Hold on, so. I was loving it. I was loving it. Hold on, guys. Sing the song. I'll be right there. We're standing on. We were saying, oh, I'm on my bed. Sorry, guys. Live stream. Hey. 
It's what are you going to do when it's live? Stuff like this happens. Don't hate haters. Now, with that said, let me finish the point. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7, right? Verses 1 to 5, because I want to show you what not to do and don't. Can you guys hear me? Is my sound clear? Is my sound clear? Okay, good. All right. Let me show you how to be aware of the schemes of the devil. Okay, guys. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 2.11, we are not ignorant of the schemes of the devil. Satan wants to destroy godly marriages. He wants to destroy godly couples who are married and come against them to divide them because he hates Christ and he hates the children of God, those purchased by the blood of Jesus, and he knows that they are dangerous. We, the body of Christ, are dangerous against the devil because we are God's soldiers, his warriors, given weapons that are indestructible by the power of the Holy Spirit to destroy his kingdom if we know how to use them and if we do use them and engage him, right? So he knows that, so he wants to do everything he can to distract us from engaging him, to be distracted by other issues in order to keep us focused on those issues and not focused on glorifying Jesus, walking in union with Jesus, being light and salt of the earth, preaching the gospel in order to destroy his kingdom. Because if he can get you distracted with marital problems or he can get you distracted with financial problems or he can get you distracted with issues that are not irrelevant, obviously, because if you have children, they're going through issues. You need to focus on your children and and make sure that God is using you to cover them and protect them. But he understands he needs to distract you in order to disarm you from destroying his kingdom. One of the ways he does it, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5. I hope I'm not boring you guys with this. I want you to understand the schemes of the devil and be on your guard against him and not fall prey to his schemes to destroy your walk with Jesus. Okay, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5. Read with me. Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. If a man can be celibate and devote himself entirely to the work of Jesus, amen. But now notice what he says in 2 to 5. Pay attention. 2 to 5. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Notice what he did not say. Nevertheless, in order to avoid sexual morality, fornication, having sex before marriage, which is sin. Let every man have his own girlfriend. Oh, no, that's not what he said. Let every woman check up with a boyfriend. That's not what he said. You burn, get married. Every man should have his own wife, every woman her own husband. Monogamy. You don't go find a boyfriend to sleep with or a girlfriend to sleep with. That's against the commands of Christ. You want to be sexually intimate? Find you a spouse who loves Jesus and enjoy her and enjoy him. Now watch. This is where the women are going to love the word of God. Women, you're going to love this word. And thank Jesus how much he loves you women and honors you and gives commands to prevent men from dishonoring you and vice versa. Notice verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise, also the wife unto the husband. I'm going to explain that in a minute. The wife has no authority, power over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, also the husband has no power of his own body, but the wife. Wow. Did you catch what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to say? Women, that's not your body. It belongs to your husband to enjoy. Husband, that's not your body. It's your wife's body to enjoy. She has authority over your body. You have authority over her body. Therefore, notice what he says in verse 5. Defraud ye not one another. Don't deny your partner's sexual intimacy. Husband, if your wife wants intimacy, you better satisfy her. Wife, if your husband wants intimacy, you better satisfy him because it's not your body. You don't use it as a weapon to bludgeon him, to deny him, to cause him to lust and stumble into sin. That's of Satan. Because notice what he goes on to say. 
Notice what he goes on to say in verse 5. Okay, watch here. The fraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your inconten incontinency. All right, now let me explain what he means here. Women, I I'm sure you're dancing saying, thank you, Lord Jesus. Wait, I can't wait to find that godly husband. If it's like this, and he's truly godly and he loves Jesus, then marriage is going to be a taste of paradise on earth if he truly loves Jesus and he's not lip service. Okay, now let me explain what Paul is saying. The only time husband and wife deny each other sexual intimacy is by mutual consent for fasting and prayer, but it can't be for too long. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you can agree, husband and wife, we are going to refrain from sexual intimacy to devote ourselves to fasting and prayer. But it shouldn't be for too long because the longer you do it, the more prone you'll be to sexual desire and you'll succumb to sexual desire, which then defeats the purpose of your prayer and fasting. Don't you love the Bible? Yeah, send 13 11 out of here. Get him out of here. We don't need him here. Don't you love the Bible, folks? <laughs> you see the love Jesus has for the women and the men. He doesn't love men more than women or women more than men. He loves them equally and he saves them equally and he gives responsibilities to men that he gives to women and vice versa. In other words, it's not just you women do this. No, 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 no. Even though it's not her body, your body's not yours either. Your body belongs to her just as much as her body belongs to you. Don't you dare deny her, and you don't deny him. Now, unfortunately, in the world we live in, it's the women that tend to deny men, more so than men deny women. And they think they use that as a weapon to control the man. Women, let me tell you something. If you do that, you're sinning against the Lord. You are sinning against the Lord Jesus. You're dishonoring him when you do that. You understand my point? And there are godly women who love Jesus who do it because you're still sinners. Let's be honest. Let's be upfront. There are women who are believers who love Jesus, but still they're sinners. They still struggle with sin and they still struggle with selfishness. And so when they're angry at their husband, they get back at him by saying, you know what? No love for you tonight. But you don't realize when you do that, you're now opening the door. Listen to me. You're now opening the door for Satan to come and tempt him to lust and desire another woman. And you're grieving the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. Can you guys send 1311 out of here? I don't know why you're letting this guy come here and talk about porn. I don't know. Can you get him out of here? Are you with me there? I am positive someone needed to hear this. I am positive someone needed to hear this because I believe the Spirit guided me this way, and I hope I'm right. Okay? And can I, and I'm not trying to play the victim here. I'm not trying to play the victim here. Can I use myself as an example? And I do want you to pray for my ex-wife. She needs to know Jesus and fall in love with the Lord and be saved. No matter the evil and the harm she's doing, she's only bringing judgment on herself. And may the Lord save her. Bring her to the feet of Jesus. Because if she falls in love with Jesus, all these problems will go away. And my daughters will be safe. I had to live with the following. I'm not attracted to you. I don't love you. I'll never be attracted to you. And I feel like I have to be intimate to you because I have no choice. When you tell a man that, you shut him down and he'll never want to be intimate with you ever again. Do you know that? That's what I lived with for 10 years. Yes. That's what I lived with for 10 years. And men know. Men can identify, right? Which of you men would ever want to approach such a woman who constantly says that to you? 
So I lived it. May I never live it again. May I never live it again. May the Lord Jesus save me. If it's will, his will for me to be celibate, may he consume my flesh, destroy my lustful passions, keep me pure for his glory. But if he wants me to find someone to get married, his will be done. And if that's what he wants, sooner than later, Lord, Lord Jesus. Never again. I won't go through that. I can't live through that. And I'm not playing the victim. I'm using myself as an example. I went through it. So my advice to you sisters who are single and are praying for a godly man, know the schemes of the enemy. Know the schemes of the enemy. You may not know that you're being used of the devil, but when you use your body as a weapon to bludgeon your spouse, to deny him those pleasures, you are sinning against the Lord and opening a door for him to succumb to lustful, adulterous desires. Right? You with me there? You and me? All right. With that said, everyone on the same page? Now, with that, with that said, how amazing is the Bible? Is the Bible beautiful or what? Did you know, and most of you knew already, but how many of you knew that there was that command in the Bible saying, if you burn with desire, get you a wife, get your husband? Doesn't say get you a boyfriend, get you a girlfriend. And it also said, husband, that's not your body, belongs to your wife. Honor her, don't deny her, and vice versa. Isn't that beautiful? Don't doesn't that make you say thank you, Lord Jesus? You sisters, especially. Wow, Lord, if this is in the Bible and there's truly a godly man who loves you and loves your word, that means he's going to honor me by doing what this says. That means he won't cheat on me. He won't have eyes for someone else. He won't deny me, but he will try to satisfy me. Aren't you thankful, woman, for this God who loves you so much to put those kind of commands in there? And you know what's even more amazing, women? Paul was single. Paul was celibate. God had given her the gift of celibacy, and he never desired to marry a woman. So here is a single, celibate Christian soldier of Jesus writing instructions about the responsibilities of husbands and wives, even though he wasn't married and didn't care to get married. Can you imagine now if Christians lived up to the command of the Bible, how beautiful marriage would be? You know when marriages fail? When one partner or both stop focusing on Jesus, stop making it about Jesus, and stop making it about themselves and their desires and their needs, that's when it fails. But if Jesus is the center of your marriage and the Lord of your marriage, you're going to think, what can I do to make her happy? And then she's going to have the same attitude. What can I do to make him happy? And it will be a taste of paradise on earth. So now that said, all of that in the background, how did Satan end up with the authority of the entire earth and all their kingdoms? No, Muhammad uh, said, the brother, brother, I'm sorry, you need to leave. You need to get out of here now because you very disrespectful and rude. You need to go. Muhammad said, you don't come back. How many of you were blessed by this discussion? Were you guys blessed by this discussion? Because that, yeah. okay. Because Muhammad said, the again, he thinks he's the Lord of me telling me, okay, you went off topic. Go back to Matthew 4.10. You need to go, Muhammad said, you don't come back. Because you're being disrespectful and rude and selfish. It's about you, not about letting the spirit to guide the conversation for the glory of Jesus. Because I don't see anyone else complaining unless you are not married and it's eating you up because you're envious that you're not married. Sucks being you, Muhammad Saddi. Don't forget the shirt. Sarcasm is just one of my many talents, ladies. All right? Now, with that said, how did Satan end up with all 
the authority of all the kingdoms of the earth. Remember what our Lord said in John 14, 30? The prince of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. What's the point? Because Jesus is absolutely pure and sinless, Satan has no power or influence or authority over Jesus. Implication, if you are a sinner, Satan has dominion over you, influence over you, control over you. So how did Satan end up with the dominion of the earth? Because of Adam and Eve's fall. When Adam and Eve chose to obey the serpent and disobey God, part of the judgment was that they were handed over to Satan and all that they own were transferred to his dominion. That's how we got here. You understand how he ended up with this authority? He ended up with this authority when Adam and Eve sinned by choosing to obey the serpent and disobeying God. So God says, part of the judgment, you're now under his influence and control unless and until you're set free by faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So everyone got that, right? So what did Jesus come to do? What did Jesus come to do? Reclaim the dominion that Satan stole from us because of our first parents' disobedience and then grant it back to those who are united to him. In other words, Jesus came to take back the kingdom he stole from mankind and restore it to the mankind that are united to Christ. That's part of the message of the gospel. Part of the message of the gospel includes Jesus, our big brother. Jesus, who became flesh to be our brother, to identify with us, to be one family with us. He became flesh and blood to be human like us, to identify with us, to be a part of us, to be part of the same human family. And as our big brother, go back and punish that bully and take away from that bully what he stole from us. That's what Jesus, our big brother, did for us. Matthew 12, 29. Matthew 12, 29. Speaking of why Jesus came, and one of the reasons he gives for casting out demons, Matthew 12, 29. Let's read 28 and 29 for the context. Matthew 12, 28, 29. Sorry about that part. Let's read 28 as well to see the context. The context is Jesus casting out demons, which proves the following. Matthew 12, 28, 29. Jesus' casting out demons proves that he's destroying the kingdom of darkness, disarming Satan. Here. Matthew 12, 28, 29. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come, un come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Did you catch what our Lord said? My casting out demons is proof I am destroying the kingdom of darkness. I bound up the strong man, and I am now dispossessing him, and taking the spoils from him in order to give it to us. The strong man is Satan. And Jesus is saying, I've entered into the strong man's house. What does he mean? The world is now the domain of Satan. I've entered into the world, the domain of Satan, into his house and telling him, bring it on. Because I am big brother. I am the brother of these human beings. And I have come to dispossess you, to disarm you, to bind you up, and take back what you've stolen from them. That's what Jesus is saying. You catch it? That's what Jesus is saying. Satan was this big bully that pushed us around, degraded us, humiliated us, stole our lunch money. And then big brother heard, our eldest brother, the firstborn in God's family, Jesus heard. That's what this bully was doing to his brothers and sisters. And he says, oh, really? 
I'm here, bring it on. And he beat the devil silly, bound it up like a little child, and took back what he stole from us and gave, gave it back to us. That's what Jesus did. You understand what Jesus did? That's what he's telling you he did. Our eldest brother, our big brother, Jesus, our Lord, who's our brother, we are united to him, our children of God, came to beat up the bully who was beating us down, humiliating us, mocking us, degrading us, demoralizing us, and stole our lunch money. Because you ain't going to do that anymore. It stops right now. And that's what our Lord just did. Can I give you further proof? Can I give you another passage to prove this? Do you want another biblical passage to prove this? All right. Do me a favor, Protestant believer. I, I love the King James, but because it's sometimes difficult for people to read and understand, I want you to cite Hebrews 10, verses 9 to 16. Hebrew, well, you know what? Yeah, Hebrews, Hebrews 2, not 10. Lord Jesus, protect me from error. I love the King James, but just, Cal, for the sake of making it a little more understandable, Hebrews 2, verses 9 to 16, and the New King James or Modern English Version or whatever. Hebrews 2, verses 9 to 16. I love it too, Talitha. Okay, Hebrews 2, verses 9 to 16. But we see Jesus. Pay attention. Guys, it's a long one, but you got to read. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, to suffer death, crowned with glory and honor, so that he, by the grace of God, should experience death, taste death for everyone. Jesus tasted death for all of us. Now watch this. Pay specific attention to verses 10 and 11. For what's fitting for him, meaning God the Father, it was fitting for God the Father, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, in glorifying his sons, in transforming his sons, in saving his sons, in redeeming his sons, and bringing his sons into his glorious heavenly presence. Right? That's what it means, bringing many sons to glory. It pleased the Father to make the author of their salvation, meaning Jesus, it pleased the Father to make Jesus the author of our salvation, the one who brought salvation to us. Perfect through suffering. It was the Father's will that Jesus, the author of salvation, would complete his work of salvation by suffering shame and the pain of the cross. That's how he accomplished and completed the work of our salvation. Now watch verses 11 down. Pay attention. Verses 11, all the way. For both he, Jesus, who sanctifies, and those who are sanctified are all of one. We all belong to the same family. Jesus, who sanctifies us, and we are sanctified, belong to the same Father. That's what it's saying here. For this reason, he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will declare your name, Father. I will declare your name to my brothers, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise to you. Now watch this, 13 and 14. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I, here am I, Father, and the children whom God has given me. Here I am, Father, here am I with your children, the ones you gave me to save and glorify. Here they are with me. Now notice 14 and 15. Notice 14 and 15. So then, as the children share in flesh and blood, if God's children are human beings, guess what Jesus did? He likewise took part in these. He too became flesh and blood to be one of us. If we're flesh and blood, our big brother became flesh and blood. So that through death, he might destroy him who has power of death. That is the devil. Wow. And deliver those who through fear of death were throughout their lives subject to bondage. Did you guys catch it? You guys see what it, the, the scripture just said? 
Jesus became one of us, like us, flesh and blood human being, and chose to do so specifically to die a human death that we deserved. We deserve to die. Right? Jesus then died in our place to save us from God's wrath. And not only did he die in our place so we could be spared death, he did so for another reason. He did so for another reason. What was the other reason that Jesus died? Jagger, if you want to go pee-pee, I was about to tell you what to do. You can do it in your mommy's mouth, right? Get out of here, you wicked Satan. Get him out of here. What was the other reason why he died? Mods, this year, get rid of Drager. Do I have to mention it again? No, you're not reading it. It was right there. Hebrews 2.15. You guys didn't read it, see? Hebrews 2 verse 15. Another reason why he died here it is. It was right there. Protestant before the rapture. And deliver those who, th who through fear of death were throughout their lives subject to bondage. He died to destroy our bondage to fear of dying. How did he destroy, destroy our fear of dying? By rising from the dead, destroying the grave, conquering death. He did that. To destroy our fear of dying. Because of the resurrection of Jesus. Because of the empty tomb. Because Christ is risen. Because Christ is alive. I no longer fear physical death. Because I know when physical death comes. It won't be the end of me. Contrary to what atheists believe. I won't cease to exist. Because death is simply the door that I enter through where my spirit leaves my body and I behold the glory of Jesus. And then dwell in his presence as a spirit without my body. And eventually he will then bring me back to the earth and then raise my body and reconstruct my physical body so that my spirit and my body will be united in a physical body made immortal and indestructible because he conquered the grave, destroyed death, I no longer fear death. That's why he did it. I don't want to be too loud, but that's why he did it. And he set you free from Satan who has power over death. Now, why does it say Satan has power over death? Because what is the sting of death? Sin, right? If you sin, you die, right? Understand what Hebrews, see, the Bible's full of meat. Let me explain what it means. Satan had the power of, of death. Sin brings death. Well, who instigated, who <clears throat> tempted the first couple to sin and die? Satan. And by tempting them to sin, and they're succumbing to that sin, Satan caused them to die, and therefore, through his temptation, Brought death into the world. You see how marvelously consistent the Bible is? And it's pieces of a puzzle that you have to bring all the pieces together and fit them in. And then you see the masterpiece, which is the story of our redemption by the triune God. You catch it? So as that... As the foundation, I just laid the foundation. Let's begin our talk. Because you know I'm going to have to do a part two on this, right? The foundation. I just gave you the foundation, the background, all the necessary information to understand why Satan could say to the Lord Jesus, our God in the flesh, all the kings on the earth have been given to me, delivered to me, and I can give it to whom I want. Why did he say that? Why could he say that? And was he speaking the truth? Now you know the answer, right? Now we know why he said that, and we know he was speaking the truth. Lord willing, in future sessions, I'll explain how could Satan tempt Jesus 
to worship him if Satan knew Jesus is God in the flesh. I'll do a session on that as well, Lord Jesus willing. But you got all the meat now? Phantom, you got your Wagyu, you got the Wagyu, and all these various topics and, and how they all dovetail and tie in with one another. If so, let's talk about Matthew 4.10 and Luke 4.8. 4, when Jesus said, Depart from me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Was Jesus saying, Since you worship God alone, Therefore, you don't worship me because I'm not God? Or is this actually proof, proof that Jesus must be God? Thank you, Joe Houston. Was Jesus saying, worship God alone, therefore you shouldn't worship me because I'm not God? Or was he saying, you are to worship God alone, and since Jesus is to be worshipped, Jesus must therefore be God? Let me repeat it again. Acts 17, brah, you keep inviting me to your channel. I'm going to get 900 like you. I was up to 270 before I had stopped st streaming in order to carry you for your live streams. Hopefully, I'll be back up to that number again, Lord Jesus willing, this week. Okay, so now let's go back and see what was Jesus' point exactly. Was Jesus saying, worship God alone, and since I'm not God, don't worship me? Or is Jesus' point... Since you are to worship God alone, to therefore worship Jesus means he must be God. You understand what I'm about to set, set out to prove? You understand what I want to prove? Was Jesus saying, don't worship me because I'm not God, worship God alone? Or was he saying, since you are to worship God alone, if you worship me, I must be God? If you're ready, let's go into the meat. You ready? And by the way, I'm going to write an article on this to go with this. The way to prove that Jesus was saying, worship God alone, and therefore, if you worship me, I must be God, because he is God, is to show from Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke, because remember, this objection comes from Matthew and Luke. Is to show from Matthew and Luke all the places where Jesus is worshipped and not simply honored as the Messiah or the King of Israel, but worshipped in the same way that God is worshipped. So let's embark on this journey. Are we ready now? Are we ready? Are we ready to prove that Matthew and Luke depict Jesus being worshipped as God? Let's do it. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. And by the way, the word for worship is the same in Greek. In all these places, it uses the same Greek word. Forms of the same Greek word, proskaneo. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 2. Okay. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Same Greek word. So these magi, magoi, from the east, most likely from Babylon, realize that Israel's king is born and that he is worthy of their worship. Now, let's go to Matthew 2, verse 8. I need your attention, guys. Focus and let me know if you're getting it. And if you're confused, let me know so I can clarify by the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 2, 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again so that I may come and worship him also. Now, we know Herod is lying. He doesn't want to worship the child. He wants to murder the child because he's afraid that the child will usurp his throne. But still, notice it says, since you want to worship him, I'll worship him too. I'll join you in worshiping him. Same Greek word used in Matthew 4.10. Now, when they find the child, what do they do? Matthew 2 verse 11. 
Matthew 2, verse 11. Hence, they were wise. Exactly. To be wise is to worship Jesus as God. To be wise is to trust in Jesus as God. To be wise is to love and live for Jesus as God. That makes you wise. Matthew 2, 11. Read with me. Exactly. He's not a God. He's Muhammad's God and judge and destroyer who buried Muhammad in hell. You're right. Okay. Matthew 2, 11. And when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Okay. Did you guys catch verse 11? Did you guys catch verse 11? They found the child, he's around two years old, with his blessed mother in their home in Bethlehem. Prophet Muhammad is Satan's prophet, a pedophile, a woman raping whore who's burning in hell. Glory to Jesus. Now, pay attention. They find Jesus, the child who's about two years old, in his home with his blessed mother. What do they do? They fall down and worship him. And they give him three gifts. Now, go back into my YouTube channel. Several months ago, I did a multi-part multi series on the Magi. And I went in-depth demonstrating that these Magi were the spiritual descendants of the Magi at the time of Daniel. Now, I can't go over the detail. But go to my YouTube channel. Search the sections I did on the Magi. I showed that these magi are actually the spiritual descendants of the magi that were around at the time of Daniel, who saw Daniel prophesy and interpret dreams as proof that the true God of heaven had inspired him by the Spirit and who were subject to his authority. So they were aware that Daniel was a prophet of the true God, and the Spirit spoke in and through Daniel. And they were aware of the prophecies that Daniel made about the coming Son of Man and the anointed ruler. They were aware of all of these facts because they were privy to Daniel's revelations. And I demonstrated in those sessions that these magi, being their spiritual descendants, would have inherited that revelation from their spiritual forebears and would have been told by those who came before them who were witnesses to Daniel, that Israel's king would come and that king would be God in the flesh, God Almighty, worthy of worship. So how do I know that the Magi were worshiping Jesus as the God-man? Because they were the spiritual descendants of the Magi that were there at the time of Daniel. And they heard Daniel's prophecies and they saw Daniel write down the prophecies by revelation of the Spirit. And they were aware of Daniel's prophecy of the Son of Man who comes on the clouds of heaven, who would be the king of Israel, worthy of worship because he's the God-man. So that's the first line of evidence showing that these wise men from the east, being the Magi, were worshiping the child as the God-man, as the divine human king. Everyone with me? That's the first line of evidence. Second line of evidence. Second line of evidence. Do you guys want to see the second line of evidence? They offered him frankincense. Now, this is all covered in detail in my previous sessions. You need to go back, subscribe to my channel, hit the like button, and watch all the sessions I did for the last two years and find specifically those sessions I did on the Magi. Please do it. Frankincense is what the priest offered to God in the temple. Frankincense was what the priest would offer to God in their worship of God in the temple. And yet here you have the wise men giving the child frankincense. Why? Why would you give... This child frankincense, which is an act of worship given to deity, because they knew this child was more than human. He's God in the flesh. 
Israel's divine human king. There's a third line of evidence showing that they're worshiping Jesus as God. Are you ready for the third line of evidence? Showing that they were worshiping Jesus as God. Okay. Matthew chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. Matthew chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. Pistol, he wasn't born. He was a, about two years old. Um, I'm live streaming, so come by. Come by, I'm almost done. All right, all right. Matthew 2, verses 3 to 6. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where Christ should be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. Now notice the prophecy. He asked the Jewish scholars of the Old Testament, when Messiah is born, where will his birth, birthplace be? Bethlehem of Judea. And notice what they quote. They quote Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are no longer least among the princes of Judah. For out of you shall come a governor who will shepherd my people Israel. Okay, folks. Did you see what the Jewish scribes said? Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. How do you know? The prophet Micah, centuries earlier, prophesied Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Now let's look at that prophecy. Here it is. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, or Ephrathah, although you are small among the tribes of Judah, from you will come forth for me one who will be ruler over Israel. Now pay attention to this. His origins are from of old. I'm about to smash this guy. Protestant, can I fire you and hire someone else? Why would you quote such a terrible translation that says, from of old, from ancient days, and thereby robbing the people of the force and the weight of the Hebrew? Little Harry, you wouldn't be able to shut my mouth. If you stood before me, you'd be crying like a little girl because I shut the mouth of your wicked, filthy prophet. Give me the new King James Version or the King James Version. Okay, let's read it again. Remember, our brother Protestant does suffer from Alzheimer's, so let's be patient with him. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Whose going forth, this is why I say, this actually is the most accurate translation of the Hebrew. Do not trust any other translation that doesn't translate Micah 5 2 this way. Okay? Let me repeat it. The King James perfectly captures the Hebrew. Any other translation that says origins or origin and translates Olam as ancient days, corrupt. Yes, scholars, it's corrupt. And shame on you for being scholars and mistranslating. It is a mistranslation. Okay, the King James translates the Hebrew perfectly. Here it is. This human ruler who comes from Bethlehem, his goings forth, his activities, he's been active from of old, from everlasting. Did you guys catch it or no? Did you catch what you just read? The ruler who is born in Bethlehem. The ruler who is born in Bethlehem. Sorry about that. He has been active from of old, and he comes forth from everlasting, from eternity. Now, I got an article on this. Hold on. Let me get it for you. Just want to do something here. Sorry about that. 
I want to show you the Hebrew words. I'm writing an article on this. So let me just get you it right here. Let me give it to you right here. Let me give you the Hebrew words because then I'm going to give you places in the Old Testament where these words are used of God. Okay, watch here. Guys, pay attention. This comes from my article. I'm not done with it yet. Okay. His goings forth are from long ago. Do you see the word miqaddim? Miqaddim? Someone say miqaddim. Miqaddim? From the days of eternity. Mimme olam. You guys see it? Let me do it again. No, no, brother. Don't twist the passage. It's not talking about Jesus' generation from the Father. Don't make me block you guys. Just listen and learn. Okay. Do you see here? I gave you the Hebrew words. From long ago. Me kaddam. Me kaddim. Me kaddam. I know some will say kaddim. It's me kaddam. The word is kaddam. From the days of eternity. Mimme olam. Kaddim or kaddam and olam. Everyone there? Teddy, your mother is pathetic for giving birth to a wicked dog like you. That's why I'm going to muzzle her and you. You filthy dog. See? Now you happy? Get rid of this dog, guys. Please. Don't you love him? I'm back. In Jesus' name, may he bless us and destroy the distractions of Satan. Lord Jesus, be glorified. Rebuke them and chasten them. Keep them away from us. But did everyone get it? Before I move on, did you get the point? Guys, expect that to happen. When Satan gets angry, he's going to distract us. But he's been crushed. Under the feet of Jesus. Yes, I can, Johan. You're a dog too. If you don't like it, get out of here. Stop barking before I muzzle you. Bow, wow, wow. Ain't nothing you're going to do about it. So that's a beautiful thing. You can't do anything about it. Okay, you catch what the text said again. His goings forth, meaning his activities. The word act, goings forth means activities. He's been active from of old. He's been quite active from of old, and his days are from eternity. Did everyone get that point? Did everyone get that point? Is it clear? Here it is again. Now let me tell you why this is important. The word miqaddim and olam are used of Jehovah. This is all going to be in my article, Lord willing, and it's in some of my previous articles. But here, let me show you. This word miqaddim is used of Jehovah in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 12. Habakkuk or Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 12. Here, read it. Here you go. Are you not from everlasting, O Jehovah my God, my Holy One? We will not die. Are you not from everlasting, O Jehovah my God, my Holy One? We will not die. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 12. Notice it's the same word. Miqaddim. The ruler of Israel who comes from Bethlehem. Born from Bethlehem. He is from Qaddim. Miqaddim. Just like Jehovah is. Do you see it? I'm going to go very slow for you to get it. I'm not rushing. I'm going to go slow for you to get it. Do you see it? What about the word olam? Remember it said, and his days, mimme, are from olam, mimme olam. Okay. Well, here you go. Psalm 93, verse 2. Psalm 93, verse 2. Notice what it says about God. Psalm 93, verse 2. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Me olam. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Bethlehem Ephratha. The human ruler of Israel come forth from you. But this human ruler has been active from of old. And he's from the days of eternity. He's from Qaddim. And he's from Olam. Habakkuk 1.12, Psalm 93, verse 2, 
Jehovah's from Qaddim, Muqaddim, and he's from Olam, from eternity. Do you see why the King James Bible perfectly translates Micah 5.2, as does the New King James Version? But be leery of the other translations that would butcher the Hebrew to rob Jesus of his eternal glory, dignity, and person. Irrelevant right now, salt and light woman. Don't ask me that question because that's not relevant to my topic. Five head, your beginning was from a dog house where a female dog gave birth to you. Get this guy out of here, five head. Get him out of here. Yep, the King, New King James Version translates it pretty good. Do me a favor, Protestant. Can you quote Micah 5.2 from the New King James Version? In Jesus' name, increase our numbers for your glory. Watch here. Micah 5, verse 2. Poor Protestant. He's all by himself, tired. Okay. But you, Bethlehem Ephratha, or Ephratha, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Did you catch it? So now, folks, help me understand this. Matthew chapter 2, when Herod asked the Jewish scholars, the Messiah will be born where? They quoted Micah 5.2. Micah 5.2 says, Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? Matthew 2 verse 1. Let's go back. Matthew 2 verse 1. Let's tie it in together. Matthew 2 verse 1. Where was Jesus born? Matthew 2 verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem of Judea, okay, Jesus is born in Bethlehem in Judea. Micah prophesied Israel's king, Israel's ruler, would come out of Bethlehem of Judea. When Herod asked the Jewish scholars, where will the king of Israel be born? They quoted Micah 5.2, Bethlehem of Judea. But in Micah 5.2, it says that human ruler of Israel... He's actually from eternity, and he's been active from very old. From the beginning, he's been active, and he comes from eternity. In other words, this human ruler is an eternal person coming out of eternity, entering into creation to be born as a man, to be Israel's ruler. In other words, he's the God-man, according to Micah 5, verse 2. Making sense? Is it sinking in? Did you get it? Micah 5.2 is one of the most powerful Old Testament proof texts showing that the human, Israel, human ruler of Israel, Israel's human ruler, is more than a man. He's an eternal being, an eternal person who steps out of eternity and enters into time to become born of a woman to rule Israel. He's the God-man. Now, why do I keep saying he will step out of eternity and enter into time to be born of a woman? Now, let's look at the context of Micah 5, 2. Micah chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. Micah chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. Mishael, even the rabbis admit Micah 5 is prophesying the coming of Messiah. Micah 5, verses... Two to four. Read with me, guys. Read with me. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratha, or Ephratha, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore, he, God, will give them up. He'll give up, he'll give up Israel to oppression. God will hand the Israelites to oppression until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of Jehovah and the majesty of the name of Jehovah, his God, and they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. Did you catch it? 
Israel will be given over to oppression until the blessed mother of this ruler gives birth to him in labor pains. So it's prophesying his birth from his mother Mary. His blessed mother will give birth to him in labor pains. And then when he's born, he will shepherd them in the strength of Jehovah his God. Why is Jehovah his God? Because now he's a man born of a woman. And being human, born of a woman, the father becomes his God. But he himself is eternal because he came out of eternity, entered into time to be born of this blessed woman in Bethlehem, the God-man born of Mary, Jesus Christ. Jimmy Khan, I'm going to humiliate and embarrass you because James and Jude claim Jesus is God in the flesh, Muhammad's God and judge, who destroyed Muhammad like the dog he is. You want me to quote James and Jude to humiliate you, Jimmy Khan? Don't block him yet. Jimmy Khan, are you ready to leave Muhammad and condemn him as a son of Satan if I show you from James and Jude that Jesus is Muhammad's God? Are you ready? So I can embarrass you and your prophet for the glory of Jesus. Are you ready, coward? Do you want me to prove to you from the Quran that Jesus is God, according to James and Jude, if you believe your false prophet, your filthy prophet? Are you ready? Yes or no? Just tell me yes, because I got questions for you. Mel Melanie, calm down, sister. I know you're excited. <laughs> Hold on. I'm just waiting for him to answer. Watch what's going to Okay. Now, Jimmy Khan, is it true that according to Surat al-Imran, guys, let me w focus on him. You're now getting, you're getting your dessert. Now you're getting a cake, angel's food cake. You got a five- Five-star meal, a full meal. Now you're getting angel's food cake. All glory to the child God, glory to Jesus Christ. Now, speaking to Jimmy Khan, is it not true that according to Surat Imran, chapter 3, verses 79 to 80, no prophet or angel will tell you to take him as your Lord, and no prophet and angel will tell you to be his servant, his slave, right? According to your Quran? According to your Quran? Come on, Jimmy Khan. Quickly, we don't have time to play with you. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 79 to 80. Is it not true that your Quran says, you cannot be a slave, a servant of anyone besides Allah, and no prophet or angel will allow you to take them as your Lord, your Rabb. Well, let's see if he's going to answer. You're not listening, Jimmy Khan. Don't let me humiliate your prophet for being a liar like your prophet. Does the Quran say you cannot take your a prophet as Lord, as Rabb? Do I need to quote the Quran to embarrass you, showing you that you're ashamed of your prophet? We just quoted the verse for you. Chapter 3, verses 79 to, to 80. And the word, word worship. Okay, so now, guys, he just said yes. He admitted it. Good. You're now not ashamed of your prophet. If you're ashamed of him, I'm going to expose you. Guys, he just admit. A prophet can't be your Lord, and you cannot serve him. Be his slave. James chapter 1, verse 1. Guys, listen to what he's saying. Don't comment. Just listen. James chapter 1, verse 1. Listen, he just said, yes, I'm right. So he knew he couldn't get away with lying. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Question for you, Jimmy Khan. Since your Quran says Jesus is now alive with Allah, can a Muslim say, I am the slave, Abdul Isa? 
I'm the slave of Jesus and Jesus is my Rabb, my Lord. Can a Muslim say, Rabb Isa and Messiah, Abdul Rabb Isa, I am the slave of the Lord Jesus who is in heaven. Can a Muslim say that? Jimmy Khan, this year. This year, Jimmy Khan. You're wasting. Okay, guys, he just admit James is not a Muslim and that James worshiped Jesus as God. Did you see what he just said? He just said no. Guys, did you catch it? So James just said, I am Abdul Isa. I am the slave of Isa, Rabbi. Jesus is my Lord in heaven with God the Father, and I am the slave of Jesus. Thank you for proving James is not a Muslim, but James condemns Muhammad as a son of Satan, and James worshiped Jesus as his Lord. Thank you, Jimmy Khan. Thank you, sir. James chapter 2, verse 1, Jimmy Khan. James chapter 2, verse 1, Jimmy Khan. Guys, I know you're excited, but just be patient. Don't text so he can read the text. So he can just follow me. James chapter 2, verse 1. Watch here. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Jimmy Khan. Can someone other than Allah be the Lord of Muslims? And is there someone other than Allah who is the Lord of glory? So you notice how he just changed the subject? Jimmy Khan, I'm going to give you a chance to answer before I send you to Mecca to smooch the black stone. Can a Muslim call someone other than, Lord, uh, other than Allah as his Lord? And can a Muslim say to someone other than Allah, he is the Lord of glory? Glory belongs to him. Jimmy Khan, can Muslims say to someone other than law, you are our Lord and you are the Lord of glory to someone other than Allah? Can you say that? You are our Lord and you're the Lord of glory. Glory belongs to you. Hold on, guys. Wait. I just wanted to answer. Can you? Can you say that? You're going to get blocked in 10 seconds. 10, 9. Okay, Jimmy Khan, you didn't answer me. Zakir Hussain is not a prophet. So Zakir Hussain is smarter than your prophet Muhammad. So Muhammad was stupid. According to your Quran, Jimmy Khan, can you say to someone other than Allah, you are our Lord, and to someone other than Allah, you are the Lord of glory. Glory belongs to you. Jimmy Khan. Let's try this again. Unless you believe Zakir Hussain is smarter than your prophet and your prophet was stupid. Let me try it again. Final time before we block you. Okay, guys, he just said no. Guys, thank Jimmy Khan for proving that James worshipped Jesus as God in the flesh, that James was a slave of Jesus, and that Jesus was James, the Lord, and Lord of all creation, one with the Father. So that James was a Trinitarian. Thank you, Jimmy Khan. Thank you. So James condemns your Muhammad as a son of Satan. Good job, Jimmy Khan. Yay. Good job. We are the world. We are the children. We are the ones who make a brighter day. So let's start giving. There are People are here when the heart is Make it a better place. Make it a better. We hear the word. Make it a better place. You see what I did, guys? Here's what you're learning, guys. Here's what you're learning. You're learning how to debate Muslims and how not to debate them. You're learning to use the Quran to prove Jesus is God. You're learning how to use the very books that they misquote to bury Muhammad and glorify Jesus. Are you learning now? Are you learning now? Okay. Now, 
let's get back to Matthew chapter 2. Okay. If Jesus fulfills Micah chapter 5 verse 2, and if the Jewish scholars knew Messiah, the king of Israel, would be born in Bethlehem, according to Micah chapter 5, 2. And that human ruler of Israel comes from eternity to be born of a woman in time, to become a human being to rule Israel. Isn't this proof that according to Matthew 2, since Jesus fulfills Micah 5, 2, the prophecy of an eternal being, a person who's not created but comes out of eternity, an eternal person, to be born of a woman, to become human, to rule Israel. Isn't that proof that according to Matthew, Jesus is the God-man, an eternal being, an eternal person who becomes flesh by being born of his blessed mother to rule Israel, and therefore the wise men were worshiping him as God? Isn't that proof that Matthew 2, Jesus is being worshiped as the God-man? That human ruler who is an eternal person, who is God, who comes out of eternity into, into time to be born of a woman? Jimmy Khan, if you want to listen, you can listen out. I'm going to block you because we don't want to hear your stupidity. You just embarrassed Muhammad. Right? Is that clear? So let's tie it in. Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But in Matthew 2, Jesus is worshipped as the God-man, that eternal being, that eternal person who steps out of eternity, enters time to be born of a woman, his blessed virgin mother, who conceived him by the Spirit and gave birth to him by the Spirit as a virgin, no man touching her, to rule over Israel, being born in Bethlehem, the very place that Micah said, the God-man, the eternal one, would be born to rule Israel. So if Jesus is the God-man and he's worshipped as the God-man, how then does Matthew 4.10 refute the deity of Christ when Matthew 4.10 shows that since Jesus is worshipped as God, then Satan was supposed to worship Jesus, not ask Jesus to worship him. Right? Satan was supposed to worship Jesus, not ask Jesus to worship him. Is it making sense? Now, folks, this ends part one. Lord willing, I'm going to do a part two. I still got a lot more. This is all preparatory, warm-up, laying a foundation. Go back, re-listen to this because we talked about a lot of things. But God willing, Lord Jesus willing, I'll be on tomorrow. I'm planning to do a live stream with David Wood, and he wants to go early. He wants to do 3 p.m. his time, New York, New York, uh, 3 p.m. He wants to do, I think, 3 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time. 3 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time, right? He wants to go early to catch the people in UK because we're going to refute Adnan Rashid. If he goes early, I'll do a live stream afterwards. If he goes late, I'll do a live stream early. But Lord Jesus willing, look for a live stream with David Wood and I tomorrow. And also, if the Lord wills, God willing, depending on the time, I'm going to do part four on being born again. Being born again, because I haven't finished it. So hit the like button. Glory to God, we're over 200. God, bless us and bring 300, 400 for his glory. Guys, pray for my health. Pray for my purity and holiness. Pray for my daughters. Pray for the provision. Again, thank you, and Lord Jesus bless you for standing with me in this dire time when people are struggling financially, and yet you guys are still willing to support us to do the ministry. God bless you richly. Thank the Lord Jesus for putting that in your heart. But, folks, can you just pray hard? As I told you in the beginning, go back and listen. Satan tried to attack me, but my daughter's telling me their mother's fornicating boyfriend, living in the house, shaming the Lord, dishonoring the Lord and setting a wicked, evil example to my daughters. Pray God will save my children from this woman, that she repents, or that I raise them. And pray this man, Martin, goes in Jesus' name. This is becoming too much for me to handle as a father, but I'm trusting Jesus anyway because he's my Lord. He'll fight for us. Okay? Go back and re-listen for the details. Remember, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus is alive forevermore. He is the God-man. He is the son of the father, one with the spirit, 
And the God we worship is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead. We love you. We worship you. We need you. Purify us. <clears throat> save us and transform us and give us the grace to be holy and pure and in love with you and the health we need to glorify you until it's our time to depart or until Jesus returns. And may he return sooner than later. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Modern Atha, our Lord Jesus, come. We need you. Lord bless you, and I love you for the sake of Jesus. God willing, I'll see you tomorrow.